Coming up next on the Jeff Crilly Show, you're going to meet John O'Shea. He is running against Kay Granger for Congress in Tarrant County. It's a bold move, but he is a man of purpose. You'll meet him next. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is the Jeff Crilly Show. Well, there used to be a rule book for running for Congress. You remember the familiar playbook. You became an attorney, and then maybe you ran for city council, you became a mayor, and then eventually you would run for Congress. Well, all of that went out the window. We've seen a lot of people who have never held elected office before running for Congress, and, and that is, in a way, very refreshing. John O'Shea joins me live in studio. He's a candidate for the 12th Congressional District, and he's running against Kay Granger. Yep. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. Okay. So let's help people understand who is John O'Shea. Okay. Well, so I'm a business owner. <clears throat> we have, my partners and I have businesses in sand and gravel quarries, very glamorous, concrete plants. Uh, we do some real estate development and we have some construction. And so really had not ever dabbled in politics before other than, you know, boating and occasionally writing a check. That's been about it. And uh, how long have you been nursing this idea about running? Ever since the 2020 election. Uh, and, and there was really a, a precursor to that. When we had the pandemic lockdowns, um, I have a wife who's uh, very disabled from brain cancer. And she lives in a small assisted living uh, house with, you know, at the time, three other women. And when all of a sudden we were told our businesses were not essential, that our churches were unimportant, that our kids couldn't go to school, and worse yet, that I couldn't go see my wife and take her out every day like I normally do. And I had to explain to this grown woman through a window why she was being punished and she couldn't understand. That really raised my ire. And I thought, how dare the government try and act as our parent? That's not their role. Their role is to be our servant and to ensure that our civil liberties are in place, not take them away from us. So I would say when I went to bed uh, at the night of the 2020 election and thought, you know, clearly Trump's won, we've got this, and then woke up the next day to find that it had been fortified, that's when I decided to get involved. And I became a precinct chair for the Tarrant County Republican Party. And then about a year, about 15 months ago, I started putting in the pieces to, to affect a run for Congress. And uh, let's help the audience understand, uh, Kay Granger has been in office a long, long time. Since 1997. And that's just Congress before just that? Congress. She was the mayor? The mayor of Fort Worth, correct. And do you have a problem with somebody uh, becoming a lifelong politician? You know, it's not what our founding fathers envisioned. And in fact, it's part of the problem as to why we've gotten to the state that we're in. We, we don't have a ruling class of people. In fact, they forget that there are elected servants. And, you know, you can understand. Uh, uh, in fact, my intent, if the good people of Texas 12 will have me, is to serve two terms. And in, during that time, what I hope to do is find a suitable person to run and back and, and kind of groom. In fact, one of the things my campaign manager and I have discussed is we would like to broadcast, kind of do a show, a weekly show, showing the inner workings of a campaign. Because as you said, the, the mold's been broken and more people are coming in off the sidelines, which is very encouraging. I think they sense that this is a very critical moment in our nation's history. And we have two different, very divergent paths we could go. And so what I hope to do is educate the public and teach them how they can get involved, how they can run a campaign and kind of serve as a resource at the same time. We're going to pull up your website and scroll down the homepage. Um, in general, do you find yourself kind of running to the right of Kay Granger? I'm running to the right of just about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, in fact, uh, Conservative Review came out with their scorecard for Kay uh, based on her voting record, and they gave her a 51. So 51% of the time she voted conservative, 49% of the time liberal. 
And at one point she was a Democrat. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Which is ironic given that she criticized President Trump for just the exact same thing. Okay. So I want to talk about some of the issues that you stand for. We're going to pull up your issues page. And as I look at it, you know, border security, we could probably spend half an hour on each one of these subjects. <laughs> what is, when you're talking to somebody for the first time, uh, what does John O'Shea stand for? Well, I, you know, I think you could kind of distill it just generally as an America first candidate. Um, I know for whatever reason, people try and make that sound xenophobic or uh, racist. First of all, we're the most racially and culturally diverse country in the planet, in the history of the world. And it's America first for all Americans. We're all God's children. We're all born in God's likeness. So it doesn't single one group out over another. And we can't be doing the things that we're doing and ignoring the fact that, that so many of our brothers and sisters are in dire circumstances, you know, crumbling infrastructure, bad education, no economic opportunities for them. And I, and I, I look at the, you know, just the dichotomy of what we were like in 2019 when everything seemed to be clicking. I know the media was constant about this crisis or this scandal, but they were all fabricated. But today, I, you know, the funny thing is I had somebody ask, what are you, you know, going to fix first? And I said, what? Well, that question is like trying to drink out of a fire hose. My, my response is, what one aspect of our country do you like right now? I mean, a, a recent poll came out and showed that, that there's a, a lack of concern or, or, or thinking that it's even important that there are patriots, uh, religion is down, you know, people's economic uh, outcast and, 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 you know, hope that they're, Children will have it better than them is down. I mean, it's just, it's just a malaise across the board. And, and the sad thing about it that really just chagrins me to no end is that every single one of these issues are all self-inflicted. Mm. They have all been the outcome of bad policies. Let's talk about one issue that you, you're passionate about is border security. Right. Okay. What, what is your stand on, on what we're doing right now and what we need to be doing? Well, right now what we're doing is we've basically broadcast to the rest of the world that we're open, come one, come all, that there are all these benefits and, and welfare that's available for you, and we're facilitating it. When Mayorkas went down to the Darien Gap, which is in Colombia, it's kind of the pipeline that comes up from South America into Central America, and it's a very treacherous trail. He wasn't down there trying to figure out how to secure things. He was actually down there trying to figure out how to expedite the travel coming up and through. So for anybody from the DHS or for, from the White House to say that they're doing anything other than inviting, and in fact, and they're working with NGOs that they're funding with our taxpayer money to do this. Now, I don't blame the people who are coming. I, now, I, I, my heart breaks for the, the travesty of the, that trip and the dangers and the women and children being raped and the men being mugged and murdered and, and you know, farmers along the border finding bodies you know, every day in their fields and, and not even to, able to leave their houses without carrying guns because they try and you know, steal their car or break into their house. But you know, there was a politician in Europe that said, we don't secure our border. We don't lock our houses when we leave each day because we hate what's outside. We, it, we lock it because we love what's inside. And right now, like I said, you know, we have so many cities and, and rural communities that are suffering real poverty, again, self-inflicted from either decades of corrupt management and, and liberal leadership or from this current inflationary policy. But I, I say we have to lock it down. I mean, we, we don't know who's coming in. There's been close to 200 terrorist watch list suspects that have been apprehended at the border. And we know at least one third of the people are gotaways, at least. So to have 6 million people flood into the country at a time when economically we just couldn't afford it. I mean, the, the country is on the verge of bankruptcy. And you know, we have $31 trillion in national debt. And I, I'd ask somebody to point to me, what do we have to show for it? I mean, are things better now than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago? No, in fact, I think this is the worst economic situation, the worst outlook I've seen in my adult life. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about the economy because I think we all saw it you know, during the right. pandemic. Uh, we were printing money just wildly and did no one in Washington think this is gonna come due? It's basic econ 101. Anything that you mass produce becomes less valuable. So it's the same with the Federal Reserve just printing currency willy nilly. But the fact of the matter is, we run at such a large deficit, meaning the money we take in in taxes is 
far outstripped by our federal spending. And, and it is a spending problem. It's not an income problem. In fact, the Democrats like to point out and say that Trump's tax cuts you know, cost, uh, caused this situation. Now, that's not true. In 2022, the federal government brought in more money than ever, and yet we still had a $1.5 trillion deficit. So take that, and now that's how you, if you spend over one to $2 trillion every year above and beyond what you bring in, that's what led us to this point. So foreign countries and, and other people are not interested in holding more national or federal treasuries. And so the Federal Reserve just magically prints money. And right now they have about $9 trillion worth of artificially created money on their balance sheet. And so basic econ 101, I just don't understand how they couldn't have foreseen this inflation. And for Yellen and, and for everybody to have said that it was transitory, I mean, shame on them. They knew better than that. Let's um, take some pictures off of your uh, your photo gallery, and as we're looking at that, uh, Dr. Dr. Peter, Peter McCullough, yeah, yeah he's, he's a hero of mine. Yeah, so and then Ted, Ted Cruz. Cruz is a strict constitutionalist. That's you out. Ken, yeah, I was asked to introduce my friend Ken at an event. Yeah, and that's Mark Fincham, who ran for Secretary of State in that whole botched Arizona election, which I know that makes me an election denier. So Molly Hemingway. And that's John Gibbs. Uh, he was asked by President Trump to run in Michigan three against Peter Meyer, who ran as an America first candidate. And again, it's not just the Democrats. There are Republicans as well. He was asked to run as an America first candidate. His very first act in Congress sworn in was to impeach President Trump. Well, let's talk about the, the daunting task of running against a popular incumbent. Um, right. I know they have franking privileges, which means Kay Granger gets to send home letters from Washington, yep. which is essentially campaign material. Yep. I mean, it's, you got to raise a lot of money and you just, uh, you're going to have to outmaneuver her. What's, what's the plan? So, I mean, it's true. The system is rigged to protect the incumbents. There's no denying that. And with her having been in there now 14 terms, there's a lot of a built-in protection. But there is a growing sentiment that she has had her time and even people who support her are encouraging her to step aside. Um, I actually met with her to have lunch to tell her face to face that I was entering into the race. She said that she was going to seek another two-year term. She currently is the chairwoman of a House Appropriations Committee, which is a very important committee assignment. But this is her third term in a senior position and the House Republican rules say that she's termed out of this committee after this I know she's going to seek an exemption, but I don't think Kevin McCarthy will be in a position to give her one. So, I, you know, it's it's going to be a grassroots campaign. I mean, there's there's no denying that the a lot of the moneyed people in Fort Worth see that while she's at the head of appropriations, A, they don't want to cross her, and B, it's a good thing for Tarrant County, for the people of Fort Worth, that she'll get a lot of goodies brought our way. And unfortunately, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. If we're, the country's on the verge of bankruptcy as it is, spending, even if it benefits our own backyard, right now it's not the right thing to be doing. And unfortunately, I just haven't seen any fiscal conservatism come from her. So it's going to be you know, doing shows like this. It's going to be going to grassroots events. It's going to be getting the old style retail politics, just getting out and meeting the people and telling them that there is an alternative. Okay, we've got about a minute left, John. Uh, final thoughts. Well, if you're happy with where your country is today, then you would definitely vote for my opponent. Um, what I would encourage people to do is get involved. I know it's a scary proposition that too often we want to sit behind our doors, duck our head, and wait for the mob to pass by. The mob's not passing by. The, the fight is at our doorsteps, and we need everybody to get involved. And that means, and especially in this district, because it's a very conservative district, so the primary is the race for me. So if you're interested in change, if you're interested in somebody who will go and support like a Chip Roy or a Keith Self, who were very instrumental in holding Kevin McCarthy responsible for his speaker role, I would encourage you to vote for me on the primary coming up next year. And please go check out my website www.oshayfortexas.com and, and reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Outstanding. We're going to end with the website again, O'Shea, the number four, texas.com. John, thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.